Okay. So this is the pointer. I'm sorry, like for that, but I will show you some details later. So that's what I uh, activated that one. Good evening, dear members of Time Shifters Archaeology Society. I'm excited to be able to talk today uh, to, to to this uh, audience today, and I want to thank thank uh, Simidi for. Okay. So this is the pointer. I'm sorry, like for that, but I will show you some details later. So that's what I uh, activated that one. Good evening, dear members of Time Shifters Archaeology Society. I'm excited to be able to talk today uh, to, to, to this uh, audience today, and I want to thank, thank uh, CBD for organizing this event and inviting me uh, to talk in front of you. I also extend a warm welcome to each of you as we embark on a journey through the time explorer Göbekli Tepe, often hailed as world's oldest uh, temple complex. I'm not going to give uh, so much detail about myself, or Simid already introduced me, uh, but I wanted to say that uh, my original uh, field was computer science, then uh, I just poisoned and addicted to archaeology, uh, because archaeology is a very important topic, and uh, it's in our life in Turkey, uh, because like wherever you go, you can find some ancient stuff. So I always wanted to be an archaeologist. And then uh, finally, I was able to be one of them. Uh, and then uh, I started my journey in Florida, Florida State University, and went to Chicago for two years and turned back to my American hometown again this summer and started my PhD at University of Central Florida. Uh, so as Simiti mentioned a little about, uh, my research focused on Anatolian art and archaeology in general, uh, with interest in uh, digital archaeology. And uh, my dissertation topic will be using artificial intelligence uh, to predict the architectural elements in Kerkenes and urban settlement plans. So today, I'm honored to guide you through the, through the fascinating Göbekli Tepe. Together, we'll uncover the mysteries of Göbekli Tepe and gain insights into the dawn of human civilization. Göbekli Tepe, 15 kilometers northeast Şanlıurfa, the southeastern city in Turkey, stands proudly at the highest point of, of the extended mountain range, which makes its presence visible for many kilometers around. Upper Mesopotamia, a region rich, rich in history and culture, is home to other Neolithic settlements, each telling a story of our ancient past. Nevali Cherry, here, and Karahan Tepe, which is also uh, newly discovered, uh, sites two important settlement dated to Neolithic periods provide us the leaves of our ancestors. Nevali Churi, Nevali Churi the closest Neolithic settlement to Göbek Tepe, is now unfortunately underwater, is a victim of a dam project. Discovery of Neolithic traces in Göbek Tepe region dates back to the uh, 1960s when a combined survey conducted by the University of Chicago and Istanbul University unearthed evidence of ancient human, human habitation. However, it wasn't until later that the true importance of this site began to emerge uh, and initially overlooked these uh, traces would eventually reveal insights into the dawn of the human civilization in this part of the world. In Göbekli Tepe, farmer Shafak Yildiz discovered a significant uh, sculpture while plowing his field, which he later took to the, uh, the sculpture to the Urfa Museum in uh, 1983. But the museum officials placed the sculpture to the storage until Klaus Schmidt, German archaeologist, recognized the statue. Uh, Hal Taufmann and Klaus Schmidt, upon their, uh, seeing the sculpture's phallic de depictions, uh, they were Integrate and then decided to visit Quebec Tepe, explore further. Becker Yildiz, here on the right, uh, the son of Shafak Yildiz and the landowner uh, who was the family with the region, guided Shimit. Then he started working as a uh, guide, uh, as a guard during the excavations when the excavations started there. So actually, like the, we can say that Klaus Schmidt discovered the Göbekli Tepe, but local people were aware of the existence of Göbekli Tepe before Klaus Schmidt was there. 
Since 1995, excavation led by German archaeological institu uh, institution uh, in collaboration with the Archaeological Museum in Chanurfa have revealed a hill scattered with the numerous stone implements and large, regularly shaped ashlars. Earlier excavations uncovered four older stone circles named enclosures A, B, C, and D, dating early to uh, 9800 and to 9600 BCE. These structures, attractive visitors and scholars, are now recognized as the world's oldest monuments, possibly a temple, predating the Egyptian pyramids by 7,000 years and Stonehenge by 5,000 years. Ongoing excavations are directed by Prof. Professor Nejmi Karol, uh, Istanbul University. Göbekli Tepe's enclosure dates to transitional period from hunter-gatherer, uh, which are like the, uh, the groups of people 25 to 50, uh, to the form farmer societies during the 10th and 9th millennia BC in, in Near East. Göbekli Tepe marks a tra transition in life phase during the Neolithic period, characterized by the emergence of settlement villages in uh, villages and the beginning of plant and anima animal domestication in the region. Göbekli Tepe's megalithic architecture was intentionally filled with settlement ref refuse during the pre pottery Neolithic period, sealing and protecting it until the discovery in mid-1990s. The intentional burial of the structures, sanctuaries, seems to have been part of their use from the beginning, occurring no later than 8th millennium BCE. The origin of filling material remains unknown, but it comprises mainly limestone chips, flint artifacts, fragments of stone vessels, green stones, and ground stone tools. Animal bones, primarily gazelle, along with the wild cattle, reed deer, onager, wild pig, and wild uh, cockfrits are abundant, indicating a hunter-gatherer lifestyle without domesticated animal or plants. Göbekli Tepe shows evidence of multiple group, groups involved in constructions. Challenging traditional views of capabilities and organization of, of, organization of hunter-gatherer societies. Ethnographic org, observations suggest that 10 to 20 independent hunter-gatherer groups, comprising 250 to 1,000 individuals, shared common identity based on material culture and language in the region. Göbekli Tepe features T-shaped monolithic pillars, which are several tons in weight, arranged in circles with diameters between 10 to 20 meters. Pairs of uh, towering pillars in each enclosure, uh, like the depicts twins, suggesting a common theme in mythology. However, there is an ongoing debate about these pillars. The pillars are made of high-quality limestone found specifically around the Göbekli Tepe plateau. Walls connecting pillars are constructed mainly from quarry stones. Large groups were likely involved in Quebec Tepe's construction, necessitating uh, planning and organization co coordin and coordination of labor beyond the capabilities of a single band or local group of hunter-gatherers. So the question arises that how these hunter-gatherer groups came together. Another significant discovery in the region is the group of parthole stones, which are distinct and exacting. These stones, these stones share common characteristics. One face, termed the lower face, is plain, while the upper face features a high and broad color surrounding a central rectangular hole. The appearance of these stones is likened to an oversized hat with the broad brims with the center of a rectangular hole resembling a feature that could have been used for crawling through the stone. All part hole stones have cons a consistent design with various in size, shape, but maintaining the general structure of the plain lower face and a color around the central hole on the upper face. Were they used as a base for a pillar or a gateway is a significant question to ask. If they were used as a gateway, 
to where and for what purposes those stones were used. Bone material from the backfilling of Göbektepe includes human bones too, which are similar to, uh, in appearance to animal bones, broken in small pieces with cut marks and treated similarly. While the study ongoing, while the study is ongoing, it just it suggests that, that these bones may not necessarily indicate cannibalism, but rather suggest special treatment of the human body after that a custom observed at the other prepotary Neolithic sites in the, re in, the, in the region. The presence of human bones in the filling material strengthens the uh, hypothesis of the primal burials at Göbekli Tepe, which may have been opened later for specific rituals involving the dead. On this pillar, the depiction of a headless human body, here you can see, The headless human body, which uh, with raptors around it. So these are the raptors, and then the human body is just here. Also, like there is like kind of ball type uh, thing. Some scholars suggest that it's the head of the human body is around uh, raptors. Uh, the supports, uh, this, this situation supports the type of uh, ritual which we can see some uh, wall drawings of uh, headless body and the uh, raptors from the Çatalhöyük, another Neolithic village in central Anatolia. The reliefs on monumental pillars at Göbekli Tepe depict a wide range of wild animals, including predatory cats, bulls, wild boar, foxes, ducks, cranes, gazelles, wild asses, snakes, spiders, and scorpions. These reliefs probably introduce a new, a unique pictorial language previously unknown, sparking significant scientific debate over the interpretation. The depicted mammals appear to be male, adding to the mystery surrounding their significance and role. There is uncertainty about whether the relief images were attribu attributes of the pillars themselves or part of broader mythological cycle. The release may have served a protective function as a guard or had another symbolic meaning uh, yet to be fully understood. Naturalistic depictions and abstract, abstract symbols are not confined, com, confined to the pillars, but are also found in functional objects like shaft straighteners, bowls, and small stone tablets. There is a possibility that these symbols were readable, suggesting a deeper level of communication or meaning associated with them. The T form pillars of Gobekli Tepe can be interpreted as anthropomorphic, resembling stone statues like human human like beings, with some pillars appearing to have arms and hands. You can see there are hands like the tight their belly. It's also kind of clear here. Specific attributes of often depicted on the pillars, such as two bands resembling a stall on the front of the shafts, like representing a ritual garment, like this one here. Belt buckles are also depicted with the decoration of H and C shaped figures. You see, can you can see here. Additionally, Loin clothes covering the genital region made from fox pelts are visible hanging from the belts. It's more visible here in this picture. The presence of gar garments and access accessories suggest that the possibility of certain individuals being permitted to wear specific attire, possibly as part of ritual attire or ceremonial roles. Detailed features such as the stall, belt buckles, and Loin clothes indicate a level of sophistication in craftsmanship and symbolism of the pillars, hinting at their potential significance with uh, the religious or ceremonial context of Göbekli Tepe. These pillars at Göbekli Tepe have been identified as anthropomorphic, but their ex exact identity remains unknown as their faces are never depicted. 
are they inter interpreted as the inter impersonal supernatural beings from another world gathered at Göbektepe for unknown purposes? The answer is no. Several life-size and not naturalistic depicted human heads have been found at Göbekli Tepe, suggesting a different identity form of T-shaped pillars. Based on a com completely preserved limestone statue found at Urfa, it's suggested that limestone heads are like the statues of male personages. So this statue is not from Göbekli Tepe, but the city of Urfa. It's like the 15 kilometers far away from Göbekli Tepe and has the same pose like this uh, T-shaped pillars and also date of the Neolithic period too. The medium-sized statues found at Göbekli Tepe, such as the one discovered in 2008, represent a different category, possibly with a lesser status compared to T-shaped pillars. So this statue discovered at Göbekli Tepe has the same kind of pose and uh, with a beard uh, and then hat and then face too. So like we assume that those T-shaped pillars are also representing humans but more uh, statue differences. Klaus Schmidt discussed the, discussed the concept of another world, possibly a belief system, where the T-shaped pillars belong, while the naturalistic depicted statues represent guardians of the sacred sphere. So like the, it's, uh, he was discussing the, the, this another world in his articles. Some people consider that is a kind of aliens were there or these kind of theories, but he was mainly meaning the other world belief, like we were like most of the people are believing like the heaven or hell right now, those people might believe in other worlds, but it is named something else. The T-shaped pillars are considered superior and mysterious, belonging to another world, while the naturalistic depicted statues are seen as powerful and important members of our world, possibly serving as a guardians of the sacred space. The animal reliefs found at Göbek Tepe are naturalistic and correspond to the fauna of the Neolithic period. These animals may not have necessarily played a significant role in people's everyday lives as games, but rather than uh, rather uh, were part of the mythological world similar to depiction found in cave paintings. Fabulous or mythological creatures such as centaurs, sphinxes, winged, winged bulls, bulls, horses and or horses do not appear in the iconography and mythology of the prehistoric times, indicating a focus on more natural representation. So like the, it's very common to see in Mesopotamian archaeology, like these kind of mythological creatures depicted on uh, art, but it doesn't exist in Göbekli Tepe. So all animals are representing the real animals and all naturalistic way of depiction. The absence of fabulous creatures in uh, Göbekli Tepe iconography suggests a limited scope of mythological imagery during the prehistoric times, focusing more on realistic depiction of animals from the natural world. So can we say those times were the earliest days of creation of the mythologies? Enclosure A is dominated by a depiction of snakes, while enclosure B is the future's frequent depiction of foxes. Enclosure C, boars are prominent, and enclosure D exhibit a variety of animals with birds playing a significant role. The prevalence of specific, specific animal motifs in each enclosure suggests a possible connection that to a totem of different groups working at Göbekli Tepe. Although this interpretation requires further research, snakes are the most common motif overall at Göbekli Tepe, indicating their significance in the site's symbolism. One interpretation posits that the spaces defined by T-shaped pillars were intended to performance of hunting rituals, giving the prominence of animal motif through the site. Exploring the potential connections between specific animal motifs and the totems of different groups at Quebec Tepe. Investigating the significance of snakes and other animal motifs in the broader context is the, uh, the site symbolism and the rituals. Quebec Tepe was not used for the habitation, but it consists of several sanctuaries in the form of round megalithic enclosures. The known nearest 
settlement, as I mentioned in the beginning, is Nevali Churi, which is uh, 50 kilometers north of Göbek Tepe. Göbek Tepe suggests the possibility of spe spe specialization of uh, early Neolithic communities, along, uh, allowing the construction of elaborate decorating of these monuments. It's believed that older traces and construction may exist at Göbek Tepe, indicating a history stretching back thousands of years of Old Stone Age. The people at Göbek Tepe likely had a complex mythology and capacity for abstraction, although the ex exact identities represented by T-shaped uh, pillars remain uncertain. The pillars, this, these T-shaped pillars, likely represented powerful beings, potentially the earliest monumental depiction of gods, if such concept existed during the neo early Neolithical period. Göbek Tepe's general function remains mysterious, but there is a strong possibility of, uh, possibility of it being related to cultic practices. The absence of typical domestic features find, and finds categories associated with settlements contents supports the idea of Göbek Tepe being a site for ritual rather than domestic purposes. However, it doesn't show common ritualistic features such as hearts, fires, or any kind of altars, as we see in other uh, ancient temples. Before its discovery, the site was already considered as the sacred by local people. A wishing tree on the right, you can see. A wishing tree stands atop of the ridge of near Göbek Tepe, is still visited by local president, uh, residents, uh, particularly women who go there to wish for babies. This tradition serves as an example of collective memory with surrounding community. Göbek Tepe lacks, lacks uh, distinctly feminine motives in both animal and human images, with the exception of single depiction of naked woman engraved on a stone slab placed between the lion pillars. This depiction is believed to be the later edition, classified as graffiti rather than original decoration, suggesting the absence of feminine representation in the site's primary imagery. So this image. The absence of feminine motives at Göbek Tepe raises question about roles and representation of women in the context, context of the site's symbolism and rituals. The presence of the naked woman engraving indicates some of the interaction or modification of the site's original decorations over time. And ongoing debates about this figure, like uh, is she giving a birth or any kind of ritual happening here? So uh, this relationship between today and like the thousands of years ago, if, uh, the, if this image is kind of giving birth and then people are going there for wishing babies, is amazing. So that connection is kind of uh, is a sign of collective memory of the societies. The transition to sedentary lifestyle during the Neolithic period was uh, probably influenced by both ecological and cultural factors. While environmental triggers and demand for the new food sources played a role, cultural and cognitive cognitive triggers such as symbolic culture and the psychocultural mindset in art and symbols also contributed to the shift. Economic factors, including the need for long-term food storage and the organization of ritual feasts, also probably uh, also contributed to the adoption of sedentary life ways. These ritual feasts may have served as a catalyst for the Neolithic transition with communal hunts organized to provide food for these occasions. Göbek Tepe sheds light on the, uh, the role of cults, feasting, and social inequality uh, at the start of the Neolithic period. The material used to backfill the monumental enclosure consists of limestone, rubble fields, filintar tracks, animal bones, bones like the remains of the meals from communal feasts. Göbek Tepe lacks storage facilities for food and domestic traces such as fireplaces, suggesting a focus on communal activity, activities rather than permanent habitation. Evidence suggests that the consumption of alcohol at the sites and large-scale feasts primarily served as a work feast to accomplish a common task, possibly with a religious motivation. However, there is, uncertainty, there is an uncertainty 
regarding of the origin of the bone material found between the monoliths at Göbek Tepe, whether it comes from the ritual activities within the enclosure or from another context. So the last time I visited Göbek Tepe, it was 2020, and then um, I just like to drive there, uh, rented a car, and uh, the roads were like the maintained by the government because the Göbek Tepe is one of the leading tourism attractions right now in Turkey, and uh, especially it's just after the uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, election, uh, and then uh, the 2019 was. Uh, announced at the uh, Göbek Tepe year in Turkey. So uh, they were trying to uh, make it easy to uh, communicate, uh, sorry, easy to uh, go there and then uh, easy to accessibility uh, for, the, for the sites. Uh, but there are some other problems because of the region's uh, risk of uh, danger because it was close to Syrian border. And then some, especially like the foreign tourists are hesitating to go to fields. Uh, so, like the Turkish government are still working on how to solve that problem and then how to motivate tourists to go there. Uh, but that site is attracting uh, all like the tourists and scholars, uh, which is kind of a good thing. And uh, so, in terms of like the tourism and pub public awareness, you can, if you go to Turkey, you can see Göbek Tepe sign everywhere. Even in Istanbul airport, they created a kind of small uh, representation of the site uh, in there too. And also in other museums, you can see some uh, science traces from Göbek Tepe too. And uh, another topic I want to say, like the unfortunate last year, there was a huge earthquake happened in Turkey and uh, Göbek Tepe was uh, also the, uh, the site close to the earthquake area. But luckily these uh, monoliths and then uh, pillars are not affected uh, negatively, which is a good thing. And as you see on the right side in the image, they didn't uh, kind of build any uh, permanent uh, structure uh, for tourists because to save the, the site. Uh, it's uh, just like the uh, wooden uh, trail like, surrounding around the pillars. If you go there, you can just walk around and then you can see all these enclosures uh, from above. So uh, the the government and the tourism of uh, culture and uh, uh, yeah the culture and uh, tourism ministry in Turkey are trying to uh, increase the popularity of Göbek Tepe. There are some series uh, on Netflix you can see about Göbek Tepe, uh, but the problem is about that uh, is they mostly focus on this. Uh, kind of uh, the stories about the aliens, you know, like that connection is also kind of uh, give some arm to the importance of the site. <laughs> and for the future of Quebec Tepe, uh, I can say that uh, they should involve more foreign uh, scholars uh, for the, uh, like in terms of academia, uh, not only like the tourism, uh, because this uh, current government is a little strict about like the accepting foreign scholars, especially for archaeology in Turkey which is a little unfortunate uh, because this heritage doesn't only belong to Turkey, but for everyone, I think. And uh, for the conclusion, as we conclude our exploration of Quebec Tepe, let us, ref uh, let us reflect on the significance of this ancient site, from its humble beginnings as a series of enigmatic stone structures to its current status as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Quebec Tepe stands as a testament to the uh, ingenuity, creativity, resilience of our ancient ancestors. By delving into Göbek Tepe's past, uh, we not only enrich our understanding of human history, but also reaffirm our shared humanity and interconnectedness. Thank you so much. Yeah, like the, we, I think we can just get the questions. From, very, yeah. very basic question. Yeah. What does the word tepe mean? Tepe means hill. Good hill. 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 means the pot belly. Like the because the, the, the okay, sorry. Uh, the tepe, tepe means hill 
Göbekli means the pot belly, like the Yunnan belly, uh, because this hill is after covered with like the field with um, like the rocks and everything. It was obvious that there is something over there because it's not natural hill, uh, but like the when you look at the hill, uh, we call it sometimes tell in Mesopotamia area. In Turkey, we call them hug. So like the, it's kind of burial the sites, you know, the Göbekli is one of them. So that's why local people were calling it as Göbekli. Yeah. Then can you tell us probably any reasons why they might have filled it in? Actually, actually, that's a great question. Scholars are asking, but uh, no one answered a uh, kind of meaningful. Uh, no one could find a meaningful evidence why they buried it. Uh, but they believe that this is kind of connected with the purpose of the site. So like the, if they were kind of uh, considering, those people were considering site as a, like the cult or like the sacred, uh, due to any reason, they may try to keep the site safer and then they just like to rebury, like bury it and then just uh, hide it, you know? Uh, but that's the only theory that the scholars are talking about. But other than that, we do not have any other theories why they, like the, the bury the sites. Uh, actually, that's one of the, the main research questions in, in Göbek Depot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, where the teeth yeah. were shown, that was a pillar of some kind. I'd like to know, do we know how tall that was? Yeah. How high? Uh, like the pillars are changing from five meters to seven meters, which are like the maybe. So 20 some odd feet. Yeah. Do we have any idea, one, how they fashioned it? Was it look smooth? Yeah. Was it made from one piece of limestone? Yes. So what kind of tools do we think they had? Actually, like the, due to the period is Neolithic, they were using stone tools. The limestone, the, the material of this, these pillars, limestone is easy to carve. Uh, but like the, uh, they were probably using any other, like the uh, stronger or like the harder stone type of materials, like the tools to carve uh, these pillars. But these are like the one monoliths, like the, uh, this is just like the not kind of combined pillars. That's the one, one pillars. I assume that they did the carving of the animals, etc., while it was lying on the ground. So how did they erect something like that, 20-some-odd feet? So that's the actually uh, good question because like the we know that these people are hunter-gatherers still, like we don't have any evidence of domestication. So like we just assume that those people are living like to 25 to 50 people together in a group, small groups. So how possible that that much people can erect those, uh, uh, like the, yeah, the pillars. So that is kind of uh, changing the history actually. And that's the most important, uh, like the future of Quebec Tepe, because like that is a sign of like those groups are getting together in some of the years and then uh, working together as group, like not 25 people or 50 people, but maybe hundreds and thousands of people were working together to move that stone pillars from its place to the top of the hill. So that's kind of uh, changing the history because up to now we were uh, thinking like the people start kind of uh, uh, like the domestication and then uh, domestication in plants and animals and then start kind of sedentary lifestyle, settles like the villages and towns. But go back to the past, we don't have any evidence of uh, domestication, but we have a huge uh, work happened there. So like the, the question is like, are those people start kind of uh, living together in a big group, like the establishing cities or start kind of settling sedentary lifestyle before they domesticating animals and plants. So that's, we assume that there are more than 25 or like the 50 people. Uh, so it's the human power. We don't have any other tool uh, so far discovered in the area. Yeah. According to what you come to so far, the oldest of the linear, what is this, how do those pillars differ those that have the oldest linear to the earliest? Uh, in the site of Quebec, you, you mean? Well, you said linear A, B, 
part had been found on the pillars, correct? Uh, you mean the linear as the time period, or right. actually they are not like the uh, using the time period for that, but just that they give the name of uh, like these circular uh, structures. So it's just enclosure one is A, B, C, and D. So they just give the name, but it's not a different time periods. But we know that they took a lot of time, not like in a short time thing, uh, because of the like the this Gobekli is a huge site. Still, like the most of it is not uh, excavated, so we know there are some other uh, circular uh, structures exist there. Uh, so we assume that the time period is like the longer than known, uh, but it's not known yet. So how long does it take to compete? Yeah, yeah. This uh, hinge, more or less, the circular stones were they used? Or do you have any evidence they were used like Stonehenge or astrological signs? So, yeah, that is a good question. I also wanted to mention about it, but like academically, we don't have any evidence of that. But uh, since there are uh, 12 stones and sometimes 10 stones, uh, people, some scholars also want to kind of make this connection uh, with like sky and stars. Uh, but there is no like academic uh, research that is uh, done yet about that. Uh, but we were we were talking about uh, maybe in the future uh, that connection might happen because like uh, 12 stones is also used in different sites. It's connected with sky and stars. Uh, yeah, but there are some theories about it, but it's not academically uh, approved yet. Sorry. I wanted to ask about uh, you were talking artificial intelligence. The use of it. What is that going to provide you, and how will that help you understand? Oh, uh, I will going to use artificial intelligence for my own dissertation project, which is about Iron Age sites, not Göbekli Tepe. Uh, but like the, uh, I'm coming from computer science background, and uh, I know that this uh, new technology, artificial intelligence, is kind of scary uh, for many people, including me, uh, but uh, archaeology should be part of it. I believe that because uh, for the future of archaeology, uh, to know those connections better, uh, the computers are processing faster than us humans, but we are smarter than them because we control them. <laughs> so uh, hopefully that will help in the future to understanding better for Gobekli Tepe too. I don't know if this is such a question. Say something to your opinion. So, as you know, middle, middle range theory, try to use that in archaeology, mm -hmm. to link an object. Can you speak up? With, with an object with interpretation. Yeah. So, we usually use, hopefully, use science to link an object with interpretation. But that's always a challenge because there's certain limits to the scientific facts of that. Alternatively, I've always argued that sometimes we need to. Do comparative studies looking at similarly situated societies. So if we could do it ethnographically, that'd be great, but maybe we can. Uh, however, a couple of years ago, I came across, I think it was from New Science, the New Science Journal, uh, studies done by them, done in terms of in the early Mayan civilization, how they actually formed. And, and so from a comparative point of view, the Mayans began as hunters and gatherers. And evidence now indicates that they would live in their own separate groups, small, small bands, but they would meet once a year in one site and build a ceremonial complex. So when, when we talk about small groups being able to build these monumental structures, could it be possible, in your opinion, it wasn't a small group, except there was a joint effort by different kinship lines coming in, and building a ceremonial complex that they shared at different times of the year, especially when you point out there are different elements of different animal motifs maybe associated with different uh, tribal plants. Yeah, I think definitely I agree with that theory. Like they, they were getting together in some part, like some time of the year. Um, 
because this region is uh, like between Euphrates and Tigris, uh, is very kind of uh, fertile. And then uh, during the like the some time of the season, the animals are migrating from north to south. And then maybe those hunter gatherers are getting there for hunting ceremony. And then like when they get together, they were uh, also kind of built those monuments, maybe showing a kind of organization, how they will hunt in the area, right? So that's always I was thinking about, like, if like those pillars are representing different groups, and then like the showing like uh, which uh, group will hunt which animals mostly this summer, you know, uh, that makes sense because otherwise there might be a conflict between different groups. I think they maybe choose like the peace instead of uh, fighting to each other for um, for hunting more animals, and then they were maybe celebrating those like the peace in the in in Gobekli Tepe, and then those pillars were representing different uh, different animals were also kind of uh, associated with that groups too. So that is also kind of uh, showing the same thing happened in Mayans, right? So they were getting together in time some some time of the year. That's what I, I think, like actually in Gobek Tepe, because like if we think that those people, like thousands of people were living in the area in Gobek Tepe or like around, we definitely could find some evidence of that. The Newali Cherry or the other Karan Tepe, those sites are not that huge sites. They are uh, like the small villages. So like the obvious, like those people were coming from different region and then gathering there for kind of ceremony or like for hunting purposes or something. Yeah, let's go that way. Were they open? Sorry? Were the structures open? Yeah, they are open, uh, but they covered like the, with that uh, kind of, this kind of structure. Oh, they originally Oh, they were originally, uh, there are theories that they were uh, roofed like the, uh, with some kind of like the wooden uh, structure, uh, but there are not many kind of uh, strict evidence showing that uh, those pillars are built for like the uh, like the carrier, you know. Uh, but some people say that that those uh, pillars might be kind of the carrier, and then there might be a roof. Uh, but we still don't know that. There are theories there they were covered, but it's not strong so much. Yeah. I've been reading it uh, just recently. Uh, uh, this month's archaeology magazine about the fact that they've been discovering like about 15 or 20 other locations like this within 100 miles. And how, how did do you have anything to say about that and how that all fits together? Because it seems like there are yeah. other complexes. Yeah. Similar, maybe not as large. But <laughs> Yeah, actually, like the uh, two years ago, or like one, yeah, two years ago, I think uh, the government uh, stated something like the instead of Gobekli Tepe, we will uh, make these campaigns about Tivas Hill, like Oniki Tepe, uh, which means like the Tivas different sites in the region uh, mm -hmm. from same period is uh, the same. Uh, function you know, has the same function like Karahan Tepe or like the Newali Cherry was one of them, uh, two of them, and then Gobek Tepe is the the biggest one so far. Uh, but there are some other sites, and there is another one, Bonjuklutarla, which is which means the beaded uh, field. Uh, that area is obviously in Neolithic period uh, is uh, something going on there. So like the we still don't know like the how many different settlements or sites exist. Uh, so far, but we know that at least like the 12 uh, of them exist in the field, in the area. I mean, I could put a very different spin on, on, on it. If, if there were lots of them scattered around, they're all the same time period. Maybe there wasn't a single big central one. You know, like when you have Stonehenge, you know, from what I've read about that, the people come used to come there for hundreds of miles once or twice a year, and then they'd have those big... Um, gatherings, but this seems like possibly a different type of system if, there, if there's lots of them all within 15, 20 miles of each other. Did they bury the other sites in the same vicinity? Were they also intentionally buried? Uh, there is no sign that they intentionally buried, uh, but um, I mean, the, since these are very early sites, uh, it's excavated, but uh, there's no like the 
like the intentional burial uh, evidence coming from other sites, as I know, uh, as it happened in Gobekli Tepe. Uh, but maybe there are some other sites, and hopefully there are some other or bigger sites uh, from the same period uh, in the region exist, uh, because that means that in archaeology there are lots of things to do, right? So <laughs> more job for us. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's another thing in terms of comparison that comes to my mind is that we have a tendency, I think, to interpret hunting and gathering societies as being small. And that's not necessarily true either. Take, for example, the Calusa here in Florida. They were a foraging society. They did not have agriculture. They were hunting and gathering, and they built artificial islands. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a mega monumental structure to build an artificial island. So I, I think, I mean, so, so when I think about Again, again, looking at how do we interpret these things. I, I, one of the things I always say is that Lobeke Tepe basically destroys or sacrifices a lot of sacred cows in Africa. Yeah. For example, organized religion before agriculture. Yeah. Right? And because the idea with agriculture gave rise to organized religion. And now we see that completely. But maybe this is another example where there were hunting and gathering societies that were in small bands. That they were a cheap, almost like what we would consider chief living level societies. And that some of our interpretations are just grounded in colonialism Not still. Exactly. Where we want to, exactly. where we want to uh, say, oh, you know, they have to be permitted. Yeah. Where, or they need aliens, right? I mean, that's yeah, yeah. So no, I mean, maybe they were already just simply coming off the Younger Dryas as a very advanced chief level society. Definitely, I agree with that, and uh, that's why I love Gebek Tepe, because it ruins many of theories yeah. that, like, the, this colonialist ideology uh, and then, like, the primitive, like, primitivism uh, ideologies, because, uh, I mean, as an archaeologist, we shouldn't say that, right? So the hunter-gatherers are that much. But, like, the, in, if you, like, do a research, most of the articles are saying that. Uh, it's like generally accepted. Like the if you say something different, probably journals are saying that you know like this is not good art article or even like most of the professors like let's criticize ourselves like the in academia. Like if I write a paper, I would go back to is kind of showing that this is the hunter gatherers are living in a big society. Probably like some of the professors are against that idea too because they say that you didn't support your theory well enough you know so we need a support the support is all other way so i i totally agree because this is the archaeology and uh, it's open to change anytime right so that's the best thing for archaeology because while we are excavating maybe like the in like the 10 centimeters later we will find something and then it will change everything that we know about the site so the gobek is a good example for that and hopefully it will give more results of uh ruining some people's dreams or like the, <laughs> making them uncomfortable so one more question yeah okay so following from what you said and i'm interested in what you think and suggesting it, there is a fabulous book called *Sapiens*. It's an Israeli uh, author, and he speaks exactly to that our misconception of the small size of hunter-gatherer groups. Um, but I highly recommend it um, because it explains the development of mythology and religion, or the transition from um, hunter-gatherer to agriculture, talks about cognitive re revolution, and it's exactly what you're speaking of. Really, it's a really easy read, it's a big book, but it's an easy read. You, yeah, I mean, if you are asking my opinion about that, like uh, as a person coming from different fields, like I start archaeology very late, actually. It's it's more anthrop yeah, yeah, more anthropological way. So uh, I totally agree. Like especially like the, my ex like the uh, example about the uh, uh, wishing tree. You know, there is no difference than twelve thousand years ago and then today. Still, people are going there and then like putting a, like the fabric, like the little textile piece, and then wish a baby. You know, so there are signs. You know, like there is a like the huge field of like the if you don't have baby, like there are some methods or like the, there are some solutions. But those people even today are going there and then wishing those babies from this sacred place. Right? What's the difference? There is no difference. So we shouldn't think that those people are primitive or 
Exactly. You know, like the, uh, they are they are one of us. Like the, but different periods. Like the, everything is changing. Like the thing about, um, I mean, maybe twenty years ago there was no cell phones. Right now we have all mobile phones, smartphones. It's changing, but still we are same people, right? So people are still going to uh, Italy, uh, Verona, leaving little messages in Juliet's wall, putting lots of exactly. <laughs> you know, in Paris. Yes, exactly. Change. So, like the styles are like styles are changing, like the methodologies are changing, but the people I, I see that like people are staying same somehow. So uh, that's my perspective. I don't know. We have to leave. I'm sorry. They're going to probably take us out. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.